Hello everybody, welcome back. We're back. Campus Talks is back. After uh, almost a year of pause, we start our second season of our online talk show on science, technology and our everyday world. Also as a way, as a university to be a community. Wonderful that you're back here. Uh, the second season, five episodes we hope to make this year to discuss our university, what is going on in the world, with many interesting guests. Hans Hilgekamp here in the studio. Welcome, Hans. Um, I will say more about you later and introduce you. We also have uh, a pre-recorded item with Sterre Mkatini, diversity officer at the University of Twente, new diversity officer, our new rector is uh, live online, Tom Veldkamp. We have a recurring column, Erik Kemp, on data and how to visualize data, and we have culture. Musilon will sing for us at the end of the season. But first, let's go to Hans. Welcome once again, Hans. You work at our university, many people will know you, a professor of physics, um, and you are doing many things. Maybe the two most important things that you are a co-founder of the Center for Brain-Inspired Nanosystems, Brains, and you are also a member of the Global Future Council on Scientific Collaboration on the World Economic Forum. Two big uh, things that we could discuss maybe uh, later also, but maybe the first thing to ask you, uh, how are you doing in the crisis? Well, actually, pretty good. So uh, health-wise, uh, we're doing fine. Also, the family is, uh, is okay. And it's, uh, it's I think everyone experiences the same issues that you feel fed up with your screen at some point after all the Zoom meetings and you want to encounter people in real life. So it's, it's really nice to be able to <laughs> sit next to you uh, now this evening. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in principle, it's going well. I think uh, teaching is, uh, is, an, is a thing that you really would like to do uh, in real life. And, um, uh, but otherwise, it's fine. I think in the lab, uh, the students and the PhD students, they still can do experiments. It's very important. They're very collaborative. They, they help each other a lot. That's very important. And uh, yeah, that gives also the feeling that we're still progressing in, in science. Mm -hmm. Do you do some nice. teaching online? Have you? Yeah, actually, <laughs> it is a challenge. This right? week, yeah, yeah. But I saw that you are uh, doing pretty innovative things <laughs> yourself wow, with teaching. Sure. So uh, <laughs> how are you doing? Uh, I'm trying. I mean, it's so hard for students. It must be so hard to keep up your motivation. Right. So indeed, I discovered this new feature in Zoom that you can use your slides as a virtual background. So yeah. you can actually walk in your slideshow. That's <laughs> so I put up a green screen in my study <laughs> and I, I can teach from my slides and indeed I think they liked it but it's maybe something worth exploring yeah. <laughs> further. <laughs> yeah. uh, well a lot of new innovative uh, ideas and tools and experiences come up that, that's a good that are also good things about the uh, the whole situation. Yeah no that's uh, that's absolutely true yeah. and uh, indeed uh, maybe uh, for foreign people uh, in the departments people who don't have family here yeah. in the Netherlands it might be hardest. Exactly uh, yeah, I've yeah. I've yeah I feel with them that's uh, that's indeed the case. Yeah. yeah. So we hope that this show <laughs> will somehow make them feel at home right. at the university at least. Yeah. So we will speak more about uh, all your work scientific work and also the world uh, council but maybe let's now first go to Tom Veldkamp the new rector of the university. Tom uh, welcome. Wonderful that you are with us uh, this evening from uh, the place where you live. Uh, you could not make it <laughs> back in time because we still have curfew. So uh, you would have to be home at nine o'clock, which is hard to make from Twente. So yeah. thank you for, uh, for being here. Now, um, not everyone will know you. Not everyone might have watched uh, the beautiful video actually of the DS where you were installed as a new rector. So maybe a good first thing to ask you is, could you say a little about yourself? Wh who is Tom Veldkamp? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I've been uh, on the campus uh, at least uh, a lot of time already for more than a decade, but of course I was heading ITC and we are on the same road, but it's just a few kilometers towards the city center. But I feel part of the community already for a decade. Uh, <coughs> who am I? I'm actually somebody with a, also a technical background, but more on the uh, environment. And I also am very much involved in the global aspects on environmental change and global change. That's indeed uh, quite a good summary, I think, of all your interesting academic work. But of course, now you have become the rector of our university. Um, that's also maybe a good thing to, to ask you first. Uh, what is on top of your agenda? What are the most important things that you hope to achieve in these weird times of, uh, of the virus? Yeah, well, of, of course, the first <laughs> short-term goal is to get over the corona uh, situation. I mean, it's everyone is corona tired <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, my ambition is actually to uh, 
uh, make sure that uh, the UT actually gets the shaping 2030 ambitions uh, in reality. So I really wish the UT uh, that their ambitions come through. So and, th and that needs somebody to, to take the lead. And it also takes some tough decisions because it, sharing ambition is one thing, making them happen is more difficult. And that's what I want to achieve. Yeah, I can imagine. And do you think that the virus changes something about the ambitions themselves or about the possibilities to, to make them come true somehow? Oh yes, I mean in, in some domains we have already accelerated the whole uh, digitalization of education and even the way we now communicate is already in, in a way accelerated. But it also needs uh, more discussions about maybe the rules of the game. I mean we are now in Zoom and Teams meeting sometimes eight hours a day or more and that's actually too long so we have come up with rules that people also actually have time in between the meetings to do other things to relax because that's actually happens by itself if you walk from one meeting to another you have some relaxation moments eh? and also some informal communication moments and that's not possible actually in the current uh, zoom and team system and that's yeah. something i think we have to develop uh, co-develop together uh, to make sure that people are not rushed too much and feel pressured too much, because that's actually happening, I think, at the moment. Yeah, wonderful that you that you say that. I mean, that indeed sounds like doing something like people first <laughs> as one of the main ambitions, I think, of yes. uh, uh, shaping 2030. Yeah, so that's about uh, ourselves as a community. So it's very nice to hear that you care about that so much. But I was also wondering how how could we uh, use the lessons learned from the virus to do people first in our academic work, to put society on the first place. Would it also have an impact there? I think so. I mean, the the whole corona situation is basically society uh, interfering with our community. and But it's also a lesson because more and more people are now used to, to work online. And that also allows us, it basically lowers the threshold to interact more with citizens, for example, citizen science, but also may allows us to actually uh, look for challenges to make a difference that actually affects uh, our society. Yeah. So in that sense, you could say the, the, the windows of our academic ivory tower have opened to some extent. Yeah, that's interesting yeah. because indeed you see a lot of scientists now in the media. Uh, yeah. They're everywhere actually. <laughs> so uh, maybe indeed something that we have been hoping for for such a long time now has come true. But it also raised a lot of discussions about how you take responsibility as a scientist in the media yeah. and how do you stick to your expertise, etc. Do you think that that should also be part of how we train ourselves or our, our staff at the Oh at yeah, the sure. Because, I mean, people are not uh, satisfied anymore with just an opinion of, a, of an expert or a scientist. You have to be sure that you can actually prove it. Uh, so people are used to more, let's say, call it open science. And we have to be more specific. So what is commonly agreed knowledge in our science domain? What is uh, ideas about new knowledge, but still contested? And what is just an opinion? And I think that's why we also have to train not only ourselves and how we communicate, but also people in, in general have to become aware of these different levels of knowledge quality, you could say. Because now you can shop around on uh, on the social media and find any opinion as a kind of scientific fact or uh, knowledge, and we should actually do something against it. It's our responsibility that people uh, actually can choose and recognize quality of knowledge. And that's yeah, something we haven't developed yet. Beautiful. And that almost sounds like uh, that we need also to train uh, ourselves as academics, right? Not yes. only the students, <laughs> but maybe also we have to be trained in how we take part in, in society. Instinct. Yeah, I mean, in the past, if you just were on the uh, television, you put on a white coat, you were the expert and everyone believed whatever you said. Those times are gone. Exactly. And rightly uh, so, I would say. I totally share that idea. I mean, maybe <laughs> another lesson that I learned myself from the virus is that we can also become more inclusive for people who cannot afford to travel all the way to Western countries to take part in events. Uh, I organized a conference myself in November, and we had actually many people from low and middle income countries who simply could not have come otherwise, but who s submitted a paper and who could take part for almost no money. That might also be something that fits shaping 2030, right? Are, are there any ideas about how the university could foster this type of inclusiveness? Well, I think it's part of the open science movement. Uh, and so we al also have to be make sure that everything is available. And also we have to load the threshold for interaction and participation. So, But be aware that not everyone has access to wideband uh, internet. 
So there are still uh, large tracts of uh, uh, specific continents where people are not able to uh, interact in a similar way as we are doing now. It's, I mean, it's basically uh, not too slow, you could say. Exactly. Yeah. So when the the virus is over and the world opens up again, what will be the first event that you would organize at the University of Twente? <laughs> 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 Do you have any idea about that? Well, what kind of party? Uh, <laughs> le let's uh, let's be uh, ambitious and opening of the academic year in the, at least with some old elements. <laughs> Yeah. So, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> sounds yeah. indeed very good. And of course, we have the DS coming up, the sixty, yeah, the sixtieth anniversary of the university, and that's in November. So let's hope. Yeah, let's <laughs> hope. That will yes. be <laughs> Maybe Hans, uh, I can ask you. Do you think that the virus will change a lot in how we do science? It is. Uh, it is changing a lot in in terms of communication. Huh? So indeed, uh, there's uh, more interaction already now uh, globally via these uh, the online uh, meetings, and we also organized uh, interactions more with students in, in Africa in the last uh, couple of months uh, who normally would not have been able to, to travel uh, but now you even internships we organize now uh, via these uh, these tools wow. distance, uh, ships. Uh, distance ships yeah <laughs> you could say uh, yeah but still feeling connected uh, joining all the group meetings and these nice. uh, these kind of yeah. things so you really feel part of the community Wonderful. Uh, I think in terms of uh, you have these many national meetings that you go to a board somewhere in the, in the evening and go back in the late evening with the train these kind of meetings can be largely replaced by online meetings, I think. Um, but meetings where it more like brainstorming and, and where the personal interaction plays a role, uh, these should also stay. Yeah? So the, you cannot completely replace everything with yeah. online meetings. Yeah. For conferences, uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, you can select now conferences that you find interesting, pick just pieces of the, of the program. You don't have to travel. That saves, of course... Uh, a lot of uh, burden to the environment, but also to your time uh, and also costs. Uh, what I find interesting now, I, I bought a home trainer for it, just to keep a bit in shape. <laughs> I put it in the, in the garage. <laughs> and the evening hours uh, where in the US uh, these conferences taking place are ideal to just uh, <laughs> cycle a bit and, uh, and, and just check out uh, some nice talks. So new forms are coming up. Nice. Um, but to come back a little bit to the previous discussion, I think also indeed the, the, the role of science in society, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it gets a kind of recalibration. Uh, the society sees that solutions to the problem are coming from science, but also that doubt is part of science, that data is an important factor, data sharing is, is important. Uh, so there's a, there's a new interaction now between society and science, and, and from both sides I think we're kind of finding out again what we expect from each other that's uh, exciting yeah. let's talk about that later when we yeah. get back to you but maybe now it's first time to uh, give the word to a pre-recorded uh, movie Sterre Mkatini our new diversity officer at the University of Twente who had a very nice conversation with Hiska Bakker one of our editors in chief enjoy thank you so much for having me first of all uh, it's an honor I started at the university on the 1st of October. I was gladly surprised by how diverse the University of Twente was. Um, especially, you know, we all have these biases of, oh, it's a university in the east of the Netherlands, it's probably very white. Um, and I was glad to see that it's actually very diverse. When I say diverse, I see people from all walks of life um, coming together um, as students, as staff, um, and trying to figure life out, you know, and um, that's where diversity starts. Students, you have the international students, you have the Dutch students, how do they integrate um, in working groups, but, you know, just in general. And then with staff as well, you know, if you get international staff in, how do they integrate into society? And so what I've been really focusing on recently is, you know, what policies exist? What has already been done to create more inclusion? And then looking at, okay, what has really properly been implemented? What exists but has not really been implemented mm -hmm. yet? How mm -hmm. does this work? Um, and then looking at, you know, what could we still strengthen? And then what is still missing? Where could we still work on? So those are the three things that I really have been looking at. And in there, I've been really seeing, you know, um, first-generation students, so students who come from um, 
often lower socioeconomic backgrounds, with parents who did not go to universities. How are they dealing here? Um, we've been looking at internationals because there's a lot happening here as well around the international community and how do we get them more included and involved. Um, we've been looking at uh, disability um, and that is physical but also mental, emotional. And lastly, where I also thought you know we could do some more is around this piece of ethnicity and race and around religion. Do you also look at the division between men and women? Gender. There are already some structures in place that we need to still build up on because we're, no, we're still not where we need to be um, if you look at the, the mm -hmm. female professors and, and all these things. But at least there's the female faculty network and the ambassadors network that started off also but is now looking at other forms of diversity as well. Um, but yes, there needs to be a lot more done as well for the gender, yes, absolutely. Yes. There are some great ideas. I think creating safe spaces to really start communicating with one another. Can I offer privilege trainings to see, you know, do you understand your unconscious biases in life? What does that do for you? How does that affect your work that you're doing? Um, looking at grant making, there are so many opportunities. They really want more diverse and inclusive grant proposals. How do we bring that element in? Mm -hmm. So very practical on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we start bringing in this diversity and inclusion idea and putting it into action? Do you have a question for our rector, Tom Feldkamp? With regards to inclusion, um, Tom Feldkamp obviously came from the faculty of ITC, which is a very international faculty. So my question is what inspired and motivated him to work within the ITC and to create an inclusive faculty and what is he going to take from those learnings and implement in the wider university. I think that is uh, what I would like to know. So Tom, let's ask that to you then again. <laughs> what inspired you and motivated you to work with an ITC and to make it such a diverse, inclusive community? Well, when I I uh, was studying in Wageningen as a student. I consciously chose uh, what they call the tropical orientation. <laughs> so I uh, did my first uh, internship in Africa. And that was a life-changing experience for me. Uh, also to be the only white in a black environment. Uh, so you also know what it is to be the, I call it always the white elephant experience. <laughs> There's no way of hiding, but you see ev everyone responding to you. Uh, and that actually gives you a completely different perspective of foreigners being in the Netherlands, yeah? because then you are part of the white herd and you stand out of being a, a foreigner with a different uh, skin tone or color. Um, and the s same thing, so that's my personal experience, being in an environment where a completely different value system uh, applies. So how people respond to issues and how people deal with issues who solve problems was really a, an eye-opener for me. Uh, and that's something that I find not only in personally very enriching, but also uh, opened my mind in how you should approach problems and issues. Because uh, the more different perspectives you have, the better you can come to sustainable solutions. Uh, and because it's, uh, it's like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the same is with solutions. <laughs> and so you have to be aware of uh, what is in people's mind to understand those things. Yeah, and that's why it's so enriching to have a, a mixed community. Uh, and the mixing sh is, uh, it's not only gender, it's uh, all kind of issues like cultural diversity, but also religion. Uh, all these things together make an interesting or relevant mix. And, and the worldview of everyone will be changed if you interact in such a mix. And to be specific, when I actually came to ITC, this is already there. Eh? I mean, I didn't change that. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I I'm, was for me was a, a, a easy step uh, to come to ITC. I've, yeah, I, in well. that sense, I felt at home from the first day. Yeah, of course, yeah. that raises the question, what could we as the entire university uh, learn from that? And what could you bring as a rector? I mean, people often see science as value neutral, right? And now you speak yeah. about the experiences of, uh, well, being in a different value system, which I, of course, totally recognize being a philosopher. <laughs> but. Could you bring something to the entire university from your ITC experiences? Yes, I think uh, I, I will. Of course, we will not uh, every like every discipline has its own culture and uh, his own worldview in a sense. 
Um, and I think it's enriching to open up, to be aware of these differences and actually to to open and to be uh, willing to learn these different viewpoints and then actually you can learn from each other. And that puts actually a basis of trust and then you can start collaborating in interdisciplinary research and, and themes. So that's something we can do together and I'm, I'm more and more actually uh, hoping to facilitate that people at least who are interested get the opportunity and even people who are less interested at least have the basic knowledge and skills to do it. Not everyone should do it if it's not if you're really strongly motivated to go for pure scientific uh, let's say uh, expertise that's fine but at least you should have basic skills to be aware of these different value systems for example and yeah, different awesome. disciplinary biases awesome. indeed i think we also heard some interesting ideas by sterre some kind of a privilege training sounds like a spot-on thing to do we are hardly aware <laughs> of the privilege that yeah. we have <laughs> maybe hans uh, you have been the dean of tnw of snt i should say science and technology for five years almost yeah. um what did you do I mean, it's 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 a tough <coughs> question especially in the technical fields how to be more inclusive well, <coughs> I think, first of all, you have to show f from the side of the management that this is a core value that you, uh, that you cherish. Eh? So uh, in everything you do, indicate that, uh, that you value uh, diversity, that you value inclusiveness. Uh, for example, when every, uh, every couple of weeks I had a, a meeting with new staff members in the faculty just to introduce uh, the faculty and ourselves. And that was always the thing that, that was also on top of the, of the message. So the, uh, diversity is a, is a core value. And it also means that people who come from, a, let's say, a minority background, they should not feel that they are kind of a guest here. They are part of the community. They are also entitled to shape the community here. And, and uh, you should also empower them to, uh, to feel that they have a position to also really shape the, uh, the university. Um, in hiring new people, uh, for example, uh, as, a, as a dean, as a, as a management of a faculty, you're involved in hiring new staff members, professors, tenure trackers. Uh, also, the, uh, you always ask the question, so what, what does the person add to the faculty? And then also the aspect of complementarity comes in view. And so uh, that also means that in, in, in evaluating tenure trackers, for example, you should not have a kind of standardized format with only quantitative uh, checkboxes. But you should actually see, you know, what, what uh, how does the person develop in his or her career, yeah. and how does th uh, this development enrich also the faculty and and the things that we stand for as a university. Uh, on a very practical note, the, the uh, there was the U Twist program for uh, female uh, tenure track uh, candidates, and we started to make the hiring of the uh, the advertisement for these positions very broad. So just to make sure that there are a lot of people could apply for it, not so specifically tailored to very specific positions. And that also meant that we had very good candidates. And then you should also not be reluctant to hire more people than, uh, let's say, you actually have budget oh. for, because budget is just a yearly thing. <laughs> and three or four years later, nobody cares anymore whether you spend a little <laughs> bit more uh, just hiring a, a very good uh, person yeah, from, a, from a, let's say, minority background. So just. Don't be afraid to take these kind yeah. of steps. Sounds and good. this has now become the model also for the Hipatia program at the university. Nice. And yeah. I think that's a very good yeah. development. Take opportunities. Yeah, be a bit opportunistic yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, just yeah. if you see that a certain activity or an initiative is a good, good idea, to just yeah. go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So rather than giving some kind of priority over female candidates, if they are maybe not uh, meeting the criteria, you say as soon as uh, they are there, as soon as you have the opportunity to become yeah. a more diverse faculty you should take yeah if you see uh, if you see a, a situation where you can uh, attract a, a candidate whether it's a female candidate or somebody from another background and you and you uh, minority background for example or uh, you know and, yeah. you, and you think it's a good idea uh, this this would be a perfect uh, yeah. addition to the faculty just uh, yeah just try it yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, Tom. Uh, Tom, uh, we just saw Sterre walk along the gallery of 60 years of uh, uh, white male rectors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, 60 years is not that long, but I guess they would all have been white males if we would have gone <laughs> further back in history. So uh, th that, th that doesn't look good, maybe. Uh, the UT has only 17% uh, of the staff as associate professors, the lowest of all technical universities. 
um, what should we do about that? Should we just say we're only going <laughs> to hire female candidates like Theo Eindhoven did? Is there anything else? Do you have a vision on, on, on how to deal with that problem? Yeah, well, the, the shortage on the associate professor level has been because of the hiring of more full professors uh, f uh, f because of the, uh, uh, let's say, the, 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 the sector plans recently. But I think what we, and that's what we're also going to do for Hipatia, we are now to going to extend the program also to associate professors. So we should actually uh, hire more females to fill up these uh, gaps and to get the balance back. And in the longer term, we should also make sure that the pipeline, that also more and more assistant professors, uh, that the diversity there is more in balance. And I want to make a remark. I mean, you would ideally maybe think go for 50-50, but uh, I always use the, 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 let's say, the population, the student population as a point of reference. So not every uh, study program has a, a, an equal uh, share of, uh, of an equal gender balance. And, and that's, if you can mimic the, the gender balance in the, the study program in your staff, you're already on the right way. Uh, but that's something, we still have a long way to go there. Because it's uh, yeah, yeah. Because you can also put it upside down. You are, you're also a role model <laughs> as a teacher, exactly. and of course, then you reproduce your own gender balance. Yeah. So uh, this balance, yeah. And but it, it's a cultural point. thing. Eh? I mean, in in, in some uh, disciplines in the, uh, southern Europe, they are, it's much more common to have female full professors, yeah. and uh, there's no reason why we we couldn't have them. But it, it's it's a, a slow change. That's what I'm saying. Let's hope. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Now, Hans, let's uh, talk a bit further on your work for the World Economic Forum and the Global Future Council on Scientific Collaboration. Uh, a, a mouthful, <laughs> but very interesting. Uh, also, in uh, the context of this discussion on diversity inclusiveness. So, can you tell a little bit more about what that council does? Yeah. So, the, uh, the World Economic Forum is, is, is an organization that has various different forms of uh, creating interactions between different uh, stakeholders, uh, the business, media, politics, uh, and since about 10, 15 years also, uh, science has become a bigger part of that. And that actually started with some meetings uh, in uh, 2007, 2008, where they started to invite young scientists uh, to uh, meetings of the World Economic Forum. And uh, at that time, I was a, a board member of the Dutch Young Academy, and you know it uh, very well. Eh? The, uh, and uh, so I, we, we got invited to join some of these meetings and suddenly we met with young scientists. Uh, I think there were about 40 young scientists uh, invited from all around the world. It was an amazing experience. Suddenly you would meet scientists from countries like Madagascar and Mauritius and, and Uganda and, and uh, Philippines, uh, countries that you normally don't meet in, in, um, at conferences. And in the Netherlands, we had this uh, example of the Young Academy, and also in Germany, uh, the, uh, the model existed, and that was the first Young Academy. So we talked about this with these uh, young scientists from these other countries, and they were flabbergasted that through such an organization, you could give a voice to young scientists working in these countries. And we felt that we should do something with this. So at that time, we, uh, we organized ourselves as the Global Young Academy, as a, as a kind of global form of a Young Academy. Uh, with the support of the World Economic Forum and, and some other organizations. And th this has become a quite big uh, big institution now. Uh, and since then, uh, there was always the contact with the World Economic Forum. They also really cherish these kind of interactions. Um, and the uh, World Economic Forum has these councils on different topics, uh, scientific, economical, uh, political, uh, but this year they wanted to launch a new uh, council on scientific collaboration specifically. And a number of people are invited and because of this uh, interaction that existed already with the World Economic Forum, I also had the chance to, to join. So we had several meetings uh, now, of course all uh, online, uh, seeing you know, what can you do and what, what is at play if you talk about scientific collaboration. Of course the whole COVID situation is you know, gives also examples of how important scientific collaboration is between scientists, but also scientists and industry, for example, and politics yeah. and the role of trust and science policies. But one aspect that I'm, I'm most particularly interested in is the uh, science in developing countries. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's crucially important that we help uh, developing countries to also establish a base of uh, scientific research uh, in the country, so that to give scientists that want to help their own country 
uh, and develop further, that they also have possibilities to do that in their own country, so to counteract brain drain. Yeah. Of course, we want to make sure that people get international experiences, so they should also be able to, to travel around, but also see it as an attractive option to go back to their own countries or, yeah. or to another country, or even you know, as a, as a European or an American to, to work in a developing country in a scientific yeah. environment. And but this, sorry, yeah, I'm getting uh, carried away <laughs> with it. <laughs> no, I mean, this is totally fascinating. Yeah. I, I was wondering, how do you do that? I mean, I'm quite active yeah. within UNESCO, and there the key word is something like capacity building. Yeah, capacity you need building. A, yeah. A, a, some critical mass yeah. in order for something to flourish. Now, the World Economic Forum, uh, I associate that with the filthy rich. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, so that's sometimes <laughs> you need to... Uh, uh, so, the, uh, of course, uh, the, the World Economic Forum is, is very well known for, you know, these, these meetings in Davos, where people fly in with these uh, with these planes, etc. Uh, there's a lot you can say about this and, and be critical about this, but at the same time, it also provides uh, an, an access to uh, these communities. Uh, there are also big charity foundations that uh, have money to spend, and they want to spend it in a in a in a proper way. So via the, uh, the these networks of the World Economic Forum, you you can get in contact with these uh, yeah. with these uh, people and and discuss. You know what? What are good initiatives that you could support? And at the same time, we as scientists, we have networks of of, of scientists all around the world yeah. that could make sure that this money is also well well spent. So that's the uh, that's the thing I would like to to accomplish to make sure that there are meaningful, positive connections established with the support and the weight yeah. and the, the and also this this network of the of the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Tom, uh, you've been the rector of ITC for 10 years, and ITC, I think it meant originally something like the International Training Center, so it is Correct. a center for building capacity, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> So yes. that means that you might have some advice <laughs> for, for, for <coughs> us. What do you think would, would be the most important thing to do for this initiative for lower middle income countries? Well, I mean, the capacity building is not only volume, but it is also long. Uh, make sure you continue. So it's a long-term process. And uh, so it's always good to have a, a long-term policy. It, it's not only exchange of scientists and training scientists or collaborating with scientists, but make sure you also take care of the second or third generation. Uh, because, I mean, these countries also get uh, more, uh, let's say, money available and more better infrastructure. They're still catching up, but they also have their own priorities. And therefore, it's important they can co-shape their own, let's say, uh, not only society and also the community, but also their infrastructure. And and that's something that requires uh, long-term commitment. And, 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 and But that's just my uh, personal ambition. I, I, I would be great as the UT has some uh, sister university, for example, in one of these less developed countries in Africa, where we actually could uh, help them to develop and then have, have a long-term uh, collaboration and actually ad help in the capacity development. And it's not that we and that's a very important that we do, it's not us bringing the knowledge there we also learn from them it's the, it's an exchange of knowledge yeah. you do it it's together they have uh, for ex a lot of the technology we now find very common in our mobile phones was already happening in africa 20 years ago i mean in that sense they were ahead of us and uh, a lot of the uh, innovations related to this were also already happening in east africa while we were only thinking about it. So it's, it's, no, it's also an opportunity for us. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you, you are uh, chairman, I think, at the moment of this ethics uh, committee in, in UNESCO. Uh, how do you view these uh, developments, these international yeah. science and inclusiveness developments? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally share your ideas. And actually, what Tom just said is indeed also right from my heart. I mean, I've learned so much. I, I, I truly think that what I do there at UNESCO is the most in inspiring thing that I do <laughs> in my life. And so it's a committee of 18 members from all over the world uh, discussing ethics of science and technology. Uh, and you think from the Western perspective that you know the field. I've been the president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology. You think, okay, I know everyone. <laughs> that you are in that committee and you know three people. <laughs> you think, okay, it's because I don't speak Arab, I, 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 I don't speak Russian. <laughs> and so 
there is a whole team of people with totally different value, views, uh, ethical theories, backgrounds from whom I learned so much. And just the mere fact that there is this building in Paris where the only goal is to sit around the table and to discuss ethical aspects and to understand each other, it's extremely inspiring. And I learn there <laughs> uh, more than I bring there, I, I, I often think. And that's something that you hope for students as well. I always try to bring that to our students within yeah. our philosophy master, but I think for any field... Well, I think that... Yeah. That's uh, something I, I would also like to emphasize, that these activities, uh, we have the, the privilege to be, let's say, on board where these uh, discussions take place, but yeah. it's, it's, it would be great to take the community along. Eh? So to, uh, if, if people have good ideas, uh, just want to know more about it, uh, just uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. speak up and, and we can include you. If there are ideas for initiatives, uh, we may be able to launch them. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, we could speak about this <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> We're running out of time, but this is apparently close to our hearts. We heart. used to do this in the trains <laughs> when we came back uh, late evening from, uh, exactly. from the Hague or Utrecht. So we, yeah. we will discuss more. Yeah. We, we, we have to go to our next item, which is a column from Eric Kemp, a master student at the University of Cybersecurity, uh, about data. Data visualization, actually. And actually, the theme for today is about uh, inclusion, diversity. The gap minder is what he will discuss with us. Please enjoy the video. In this first episode of Show Me the Data, we will look at a chart from Gapminder. This foundation is helping to point out common misconceptions. For example, we humans seem to like stories about two separate groups with a gap in between, us versus them. But usually, the majority is right there in the middle, where this gap is supposed to be. Gapminder makes us aware of this so-called gap instinct by looking at the majority rather than the extremes. Enough talking, let's look at a chart. So what do we see here? Every bubble is a country with a color for each continent. Countries with a high life expectancy are high up and countries with a low life expectancy are down there. Low income countries are on the left and high income countries are on the right. The big bubbles are China and India. We are now in the year 1800. We see that people around the world are generally poor and die young. If you were born in the Netherlands in 1800, you were expected to live for only 40 years. And now comes the real power of this chart. We can travel through time to see 200 years of progress. You can also speed it up and look for interesting changes yourself. Let's slow down here and see, whoa, what was that? This big crash in 1918 was the Spanish flu pandemic. I already wonder how COVID-19 will be visible in this chart. If we continue all the way to 2020, we see that the world is now a much better place than it was before. This chart is a typical example of an exploratory visualization. You take the data as the starting point of your investigation and you explore it by interacting with the chart. It's really interesting to discover these insights, so I encourage you to try it yourself. I would like to show one more fascinating story and it happened during my lifetime. Let's take a look at China. In 1993, the majority of Chinese people were in extreme poverty. Let's press play. In one generation, the average Chinese person has gone from an income of around 2,000 euros to 18,000 euros per year. We have to realize that these are not just numbers. In the words of the late Hans Rosling, numbers are boring. It's the people behind those numbers that are interesting. We see a big red bubble moving, but it reflects more than 1 billion people who don't have to commute to find water anymore and have now access to medicine. They work for long hours, but they can now actually save some money and they might even consider a short holiday to a city nearby. When I think about this extraordinary achievement, I keep wondering why Chinese politics is not built on pride and empowering citizens. It seems to be built upon fear and state control instead. I really hope that will change, because I strongly believe pride is a much better motivator than fear. And the Chinese have all the reason to be incredibly proud. That was it for today. You can play with this chart yourself at gapminder.org. What is the main takeaway of today? If you ever hear someone talk about us versus them, 
remember your gap instinct and tell them the majority is probably right there in the middle. Wonderful, I think Eric uh, did a very nice explanation. So data, data visualization becomes more important. W what role do you think it could play uh, maybe in the mission of the UT or maybe even in your mission uh, at, at the Global uh, Forum? Yeah, well, data is, 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 you know, is everywhere. It, it's, it's the key thing. Eh? It's, uh, science is all about, all about data, getting an understanding of what's going on, making it vis visible eh? to show trends also to the general public and to politicians making your point, but at the same time, it's also, you know, there are questions related to data, who owns the data, privacy related aspects, uh, you know, all about it in the in terms of the Corona app. Uh, also misuse of data, uh, people shop selectively in data. So I think for the university, it's very important also to be a kind of a beacon in, in a proper use of, uh, of data uh, that fits very well with the, uh, with the shaping uh, vision. Uh, to, to make sure that data is, is properly used, properly treated, uh, and, and used for the in the good way. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Now, indeed, uh, well, that whole idea of the gap minder, uh, I've got mind the gap. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it could be a very nice way also to be aware of the gaps that there are between males and females, people from different cultures. Maybe also at our university, it could be a helpful tool. Yeah. 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 So that actually makes a nice red line <laughs> or red weaving thread, <laughs> I should say, through this, uh, this episode. Maybe it's, it's time to go to something completely different now, uh, culture, because that's what keeps us alive, I think, in the crisis. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of culture on campus, and Musilon will be with us today, our student vocal group, and they formed a super good online choir, and they will sing for all of us now. Enjoy. This was so good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Musilon. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I think this will take us uh, through uh, the coming weeks, uh, the coming month, until we have a next episode of Campus Talks. <laughs> uh, Hans, thank you so much for being with us. And there was so much more to speak also about the brain and the nanotechnology around that, uh, maybe in, in another episode. <laughs> Tom, thank you for being with us uh, online. Wonderful that you were there and that you shared uh, all your uh, views and ideas with us. And of course, everyone at home, thank you for being with us as well. Uh, uh, we are very happy that we are back. We are very happy that you were back. Uh, it's an exciting time, a challenging time maybe for many of us. But uh, 
let's just uh, try to stay healthy, hold on to each other, and uh, we look forward to the next episode in exactly a month from now. Stay tuned. See you then. Bye-bye.